John Branker is co-executor of Michael Jackson's estate. The estate's already grossed more than every other celebrity estate combined. Howard Weissman is the attorney for the estate. John Branker and Howard Weissman join me now. Let me start with you, John. Uh, you, you very rarely uh, give television interviews. What is your primary motivation in, in going public now? Well, Pierce, uh, Michael is no longer with us, obviously, and we felt that we have a, a message to get out to talk about the Circa Mortal show and various other questions that uh, we, we felt would be good to address at this time. You knew Michael for well on 30 years, um, an extraordinarily long relationship with him. Uh, how would you describe the nature of your relationship over that time? It was a bit roller coaster, wasn't it? You sort of dipped in and out of his business life. Well, we started in January of 1980, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget the first meeting. Um, Michael had his sunglasses on, and in the middle of the interview, he leaned over and he said, Branka, do I know you? I said, I, I don't think so, Michael. I think this is the first time we've met. And he said, are you sure? And I said, Michael, I think I would remember. <laughs> so we went for about a decade, and then on and off for pretty close to three decades, um, I was a, his principal business advisor throughout much of that period, and we had developed a friendship as well. I interviewed him once, a fascinating experience, and I've discussed this on the show a few times, but you're the most interesting guy to talk to about that, because I found when I talked to him about charity work or children or whatever it may be, he had a very soft, gentle, high-pitched voice. When I talked to him about anything to do with business, it seemed to drop a couple of octaves, and he became much more serious and dare I say, adult in the way he spoke. Did you find that with him? Absolutely. Michael was multifaceted. Uh, he, he was misunderstood in some ways, but we think that the movie This Is It gave uh, fans a pretty good glimpse at the real Michael. He was a perfectionist, and at the same time, he was a humanitarian who respected the work of his fellow artists. A good businessman, would you say? Yeah, Michael had great instincts, particularly with regard to marketing and promotion. He was always connected with his fans, um, and he's had a loyal fan base to this day. You had the, this extraordinary experience with him on Thriller, when most videos at the time were going for about $50,000 to make them. And Michael had this ever more fanciful plan, which meant the cost of making the Thriller video is going to be a million dollars. And he came to you and said, right, Branka, make this work. Hmm. And you had the brilliant idea of going off and pitching the making of the Thriller video as a TV show in its own right and a video. And you sold that for 1.2 million. So you ended up making Michael a, a, a profit. He must have thought you were a genius, didn't he? Well, Michael was the genius. Um, but the Thriller video was so good, uh, it's been considered the greatest video of all time. And, and the other really smart business move that Michael Jackson made, I know you were heavily involved in this, was the, the decision to get his hands on the Beatles catalog. Tell me about that process. Well, Michael was good friends with Paul McCartney. And after Thriller, uh, Michael had a lot of money, a lot of cash. So Michael asked me to call Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono, his good friends. He did not want to bid against them. And I spoke with Yoko, and I said, Yoko, are you bidding on this catalog? And she said, no, we'd be thrilled if Michael could get it rather than some big corporation. I spoke to uh, Paul McCartney's lawyer, who said they were not bidding. Uh, so we went out. It took us a year to close that deal. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of competition. But Michael was passionate. He wanted to invest in things that he was passionate about. So we did buy the Beatles catalog. We later bought some Elvis Presley copyrights. And that publishing company now forms the cornerstone for his uh, net worth. And in terms of the Beatles uh, music, is that still part of Michael's estate? Absolutely. And in yes. terms of, the, of the, the sheer number crunching here, could you tell me now what he paid for it and what it might now be worth? Well, we bought the catalog in 1985. We spent $47.5 million, which is well known. We sold off a background music library, so his net investment was about $41 million. And while I can't give out confidential details, it's been reported that Sony ATV is worth upwards of $2 billion, and, and Michael owns half. Wow.
So it was, it, he took it from 40-odd million to a billion dollars. Yes, and I would say in addition to Sony ATV, Michael has his own publishing company, which is called MyJack, which owns all of his own songs, as well as many other songs we've bought over the years. So when you add the two companies together, it's even more valuable. So, so all this stuff about Michael being half a billion dollars in debt when he died is a load of baloney, isn't it? Presumably the, the publishing rights alone, by the sound of it, were worth several billion dollars. Well, Pierce, I'd like to comment on, on, on the speculation about Michael's debt. Um, uh, net worth, you know, one doesn't want to have to sell those assets. So, it, it, you know, those, those are cornerstone assets that we keep on, we plan on keeping for Michael's children and, and keeping those in the family. What kind of decisions have you taken which have turned out to be very smart ones in the relation to handling his estate? We must all care and commit to part well, my co-executor John McLean and I, I mean, let's face it, Pierce, we're fortunate to represent Michael Jackson, which makes our job an easy one in some senses. Uh, but I think the first thing we did is we, we made a decision to green light this is it, the motion picture. Mm. And I will say at the time we were criticized. People, uh, you know, some family members said Michael wouldn't want these rehearsal tapes out there. But John and I felt that you really saw Michael as a great artist and a great humanitarian. That was our first big decision. And it went on to become the biggest documentary and the biggest concert film of all time. And it, I think we converted uh, even new followers for Michael. When I interviewed Jermaine Jackson recently, he said that there were lots of outtakes from that film, which if people saw those, they would be concerned about Michael's fragility, his fragile condition. What would you say to that? I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, Kenny Ortega, who is a great director, uh, went through all of the footage to assemble it together. And, you know, I think with any artist, they have their, their great days and they have off days. That's the nature of rehearsal. Uh, so I have not seen all the, the outtakes, but um, I'm pretty confident that what you see on the screen represented the true Michael. I mean, you were so close to him that at one stage, when you, you got married for the first time, Michael came, was best man. He brought Bubbles the chimp, who wore a tuxedo. Little Richard was the minister. I mean, hard to imagine anyone being as close to him as you were at the time. He brought you back into his business life shortly before he died, didn't he? To, was that to run the concert stage of things? I know you weren't working for AEG, but explain that relationship. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that first wedding because I have fond memories uh, of Michael being the best man and uh, Bubbles in the tuxedo. It, it was priceless. <laughs> um, it, it was priceless. Um, in terms of coming back into Michael's life, we, we separated amicably in 2006. Uh, and I got a call from Michael's manager, Frank DeLeo, uh, about a month uh, before we met. And Michael was excited and Frank was excited about the tour. And they wanted me to give some thought about some ideas of what we could do around the tour. Uh, Frank DeLeo and I met several times and then finally I met uh, again with Michael. About a week before he passed away, we met at the forum where, where he was rehearsing. And um, I'm, I'm so glad that we got that chance to, to see each other again. And how did he seem to you? It wasn't a long meeting. Uh, you know, it was, I, I was there for perhaps an hour. Um, and, and Michael seemed fine. He seemed, you know, there, was, there were different Michaels. I've seen Michael uh, at times where he's been very introverted and very quiet and other times where he's ve uh, very extroverted. I think that night he was really preparing for the show. He was le leaving for in England soon. So it was hard to draw any conclusions from that meeting. I want to take a short break, uh, John. When we come back, I want to talk to you and Howard about the moment you heard that Michael had died and the problems that you've had in running this extraordinarily complex estate.